So we have uh, Carlos Brito Cruz, Renan Bercana, Tim Eifler, Rogério Rosenfeld, and Lerton Sodre. So, uh, so the idea is for Carlos Brito Cruz to say, if, um, if, uh, because he's not a cosmologist, he'll say something about FAPES and the role of Sao uh, San Paulo, and, and he'll tell us more about that. And then we'll have, again, five-minute presentations from the other four. So thanks. Okay. Uh, well, if you sit there, you're going to be able to see. Yeah. Okay, well, good afternoon. Thanks for the invitation to participate in this discussion, telling you a little bit about how we are working at the Sao Paulo Research Foundation, FAPESP, on large research collaborations in the fields of astronomy and cosmology. So I'll use one slide to give you an idea of research in the state of Sao Paulo in Brazil, then one slide about the Sao Paulo Research Foundation, then a few slides about the collaborations. Uh, the state of Sao Paulo. Brazil is a federative republic. We have 26 states. The state of Sao Paulo is one of the 26. It's in the southeast of Brazil. The state of Sao Paulo has a population of uh, 42 million people, which, uh, which I should stay there? Why is that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so why is, why is that you have a mobile microphone if I cannot move? <laughs> Uh, okay, well, the state of Sao Paulo has a population of 42 million people, uh, so in population it's more or less the size of Argentina and Spain. And the state of Sao Paulo responds for about one-third of the GDP of Brazil. One-third of the GDP of Brazil makes the economy of the state of Sao Paulo larger than the economy of Argentina and slightly smaller than the economy of Spain. Researchers in the state of Sao Paulo are authors in 43% of the articles published by researchers in Brazil, even though the state has 20% of the population of Brazil. And the universities in the state of Sao Paulo graduated in 2017 7,002, almost 7,300 PhDs. So, that is to say that it's a place where there is a lot of stuff going on in terms of research and uh, development. And I'm not going to go through all the, the topics here, but I just want to mention to you what is in the upper bar here, which uh, is the number of researchers which are active in the state of Sao Paulo. They are almost 70,000. 38,500 work in the business sector. So more than half of all the researchers who work in the state of Sao Paulo work for the business sector. This is in, it's relevant mostly for us here in Brazil because people in Brazil think that there is no research in the business sector. They are subject to what happened to people in the time of Pasteur they don't believe in the things they cannot see. So they couldn't see the microorganisms, so they said, well, there are no microorganisms. They were there, you have to look the right way. So when you count the right way, because many researchers tend to stay in their universities and not go around to see what's going on, they think that there is research only in universities. That's not true. More than half are outside universities, 27,000 in universities, 4,000 in research institutes. Uh, the research uh, enterprise in the state of Sao Paulo brings uh, relevant results. This shows that researchers in Sao Paulo publish more scientific articles than researchers in any other country in Latin America. That's the blue is Sao Paulo, then uh, Mexico, Argentina, Chile, Colombia, and others. Uh, and part of this effort is done by the Sao Paulo Research Foundation, FAPESP, which is funded, a foundation funded by the taxpayer in the state of Sao Paulo. 
and this foundation gets 1% of all the tax revenues of the state. The constitution of the state has an article that mandates that the government has to send this money to FAPESP every month. They have to calculate how much money they think they receive at the preceding year, calculate 1% and send that to the foundation. That means the foundation never has to negotiate a budget with the government or with the state assembly. And uh, differently from what happens in most of other states in Brazil, the government of the state of Sao Paulo follows the constitution and they send the money every month uh, so that the foundation has a stable budget and a predictable budget. Uh, last year, we analyzed 26,000 research proposals uh, and we spent 1.2 billion Brazilian reais funding fellowships, academic research, university, university industry collaborations, and small business uh, research. Uh, our strategy, if we would summarize in one slide, our objectives is that we would like research to bring results to the benefit of society. And we see those in at least three dimensions. One dimension is we want research to create new ideas, not to do research about things that have already been done, but to discover new stuff. So we talk about intellectual impact, ideas that will generate new ideas that will motivate researchers in other places to study about those. Then there is social impact. Many ideas, not all, but many ideas can bring direct or short-term impact for the population. That happens a lot in health, the environment, and public policy and other topics. And some other ideas have economic impact. They can be used to create new businesses, to make a business work better, make more money, create jobs, and so on. So those are the three things we look for. At the foundation, actually, we always look for intellectual impact, for new stuff, for originality, for, I would say, nice science. You know how you recognize nice science. Nice science is science that when you read the start, the beginning of the paper, the first thought that comes to your mind is, why is that I didn't have that idea? So that's what we, we look for in the projects that we fund at the Sao Paulo Research Foundation. And then some of them will bring social impact, some will bring economic impact. In terms of uh, collaborations and uh, research facilities. We have a, a, a list which is here on the left side, which goes from neutrino physics, uh, CERN, LHC, uh, the synchrotron light source that's being built in Brazil, uh, laboratory for high-end microscopy, which is in the Center for Energy Research. Then we have this list of topics which relate to your topic here, which is astronomy and cosmology. We have Llama, which we uh, collaborate with Argentina to build a radio telescope, which will work in partnership with ALMA. Uh, and then there is the Great Magellan Telescope, which also FAPESP is part of it. Researchers in the state of Sao Paulo will have about 4% of the time to use the telescope. Uh, then there is the Cherenkov Telescope Array, CTA, uh, researchers from the University of Sao Paulo in Sao Paulo and uh, in Sao Carlos. Then there is BINGO, which is the baryonic oscillations uh, experiment, which is being built. They are finishing the decision about the location and working with the antennas that they are going to use. Then there is this older one, which is the Pierre Roger Observatory, which was installed many years ago in Argentina. And then there is the Southern Observatory for Astronomical Research, which is a smaller telescope, because it's older, it's from 1998 or 1999, which was installed in Chile. 
And we have several other smaller facilities and so on, but I want just to, to mention to you that we have this information about all the astronomy research that we fund, and most of it is in, in large collaborations, which you can look at in this uh, website, fapespastro.pdf. Uh, and uh, I'll just mention to you that in astronomy and cosmology in the state of Sao Paulo, we have about 145 principal investigators. Principal investigators in our calculation is, or counting, is the number of people who requested funding from FAPESP in a period of 10 years, in the last 10 years. So there are 145 of those in the state of Sao Paulo. And uh, again, in, well, in three years from 2015 to 2018, we approved 145 grants for astronomy and cosmology. Uh, we, spent, we contracted 230 million Brazilian reais in projects in the 10 years between 2008 to 2017. And those scientists are now publishing 600 articles per year. It's a, it's a good number. And uh, in 2018, that represented 2.5% of the total world, the number, the total of the world in astronomy and cosmology. And uh, we are, this is relevant for us because we know that this percentage was 1% in 2000. So researchers in Sao Paulo are becoming more productive, are participating more in this activity. This, uh, these activities happen in the city of Sao Paulo. They happen also in San Jose dos Campos. Then there is a, an observatory here. Uh, then there is Campinas and São Carlos, and it's very small in other other locations in the in the state. So this one shows the number of articles per year, which is getting to 600. Uh, this one shows the impact, the number of citations divided by the number of articles, which has grown steeply here since 2004, getting to be around two, uh, and. Uh, that's the one that shows you that it's getting to be 2.5% with a special, there, there was a change in the slope here around 2008. Uh, in terms of the expectations of the foundation when we accept, when we approve a grant to participate in a large collaboration, I try to summarize here the, the, the what we think about. It doesn't mean we want all of those topics to be present, but we want to, we always discuss with the researcher about those topics to see how they can adjust or adapt their project to try to fulfill each one of those uh, criteria. One, of course, that's very easy. We do that because we want to facilitate international collaboration. But then we, consider also the relevance of the participation of the researcher that we are going to fund. You know that it's not difficult to enter in a collaboration and not do many things which are very relevant and have your name on a paper. <laughs> That's not what we are looking for. We are looking for participation in which they have a chance to participate in specifying the problem, looking for the ideas, finding the solutions to obtain the results, and so on. Uh, we also look for a participation in which researchers from the state of Sao Paulo have some opportunity to act in the governance of the collaboration at some level. Many times they start at a lower level and then they move up and become responsible for a sector, for a division, for a a section, and so on. Uh, then uh, we value the opportunities in which uh, they bring uh, responsibility for the development in, of instrumentation, because that many times help us to involve the business sector in the state of Sao Paulo in the project. So we have had, in all those that I have listed to you, many nice cases of uh, projects that generated opportunity for 
companies in the state of Sao Paulo, those companies had to develop some technology and we can fund them uh, in parallel to the activity to develop the technology and then they will be providers of uh, to the project. Uh, then we also value the idea of young talent recruitment, of using the opportunity to collaborate and to collaborate in a protagonistic way to uh, entice young scientists of any nationality from any country who are willing to come to Sao Paulo to start a career here. Usually those are postdocs who have been postdocs for two, three, five, seven years, and then they decide to come here. We have a special type of grant. It's like, those of you who know Europe, it's like an ERC starting grant. It's a five-year grant with equipment, consumables, fellowships. Most of the time it's a multi-million dollar grant for this young researcher to start their position. For example, a recent case, very successful that we have, is this person we brought from Italy to uh, work in experimental neutrino physics at the University of Campinas, Ettore Segreto, and he had an idea in the detection of neutrinos, and now he is the leader of the division of neutrino detection at Fermilab in the Dune experiment. Everything funded by FAPES, he's a professor in Campinas. He goes there, he does his stuff there. So that's the, the kind of opportunity we look for. Uh, then, uh, last point here is creating opportunities for industrial development, which will bring uh, challenges for industrial research and development and industry participation in furnishing and providing stuff. Uh, I had, for example, a, an interesting meeting a few weeks ago when I put together a number of small companies in Sao Paulo to discuss with the director of Fermilab, Nigel, who came down about an opportunity. And then the guys from Fermilab come and explain to them, well, you know, we are detecting neutrinos, and neutrinos are very difficult, very difficult to detect. And the way, what we need from you is the following. We need, we have this mine, there is a hole 500 meters down in the ground, and we have rooms there, and we need to fill this, those rooms with 20 billion liters of liquid argon. And we want you guys to provide the liquid argon to put there. And the companies almost run away from the room, like, well, that's too complicated, it's not for me. But then we, we discussed it, they understood that each one would do a small part of the thing, and then we are now building this consortium of companies who are going to put the 20 billion liters of liquid argon down in the ground in some place in South Dakota to detect neutrinos. So this is the kind of challenge that we look for in terms of industry participation. I will finish by mentioning to you that here in the state of Sao Paulo, being stimulated by FAPES, the researchers organize, organized the SPA Net, Sao Paulo Astronomy Network, a Rede Paulista de Astronomia, which uh, congregates the researchers and because we want them to work, or you, whatever, to work in a more articulated way, to work sharing challenges, sharing solutions and collaborating. It's not only collaborating with the guys in the other side of, of the Atlantic. It's collaborating between the guys in Sao Paulo, in Campinas, in San Jose dos Campos, and so on. And they have this newsletter, which is very useful if you want to learn what's going on in astronomy and cosmology in the state of Sao Paulo. Thank you very much.
Okay, so for those who don't know me, my name is uh, Rogério Rosenfeld. I'm a professor here at the Institute of Theoretical Physics and also part of SAFER, the uh, ICDP SAFER. And I'm a particle physicist. Um, and, but I decided, I started working on cosmology, I don't know, maybe 10, 20 years ago, with Raul, actually. When you, and we were doing some theoretical work <laughs> in dark energy and, and especially the possibility of dark energy to uh, condense and participate more in the dynamics uh, of the universe. And um, at the same time, the community was starting to participate, the community in cosmology were starting to participate in international uh, projects. And uh, I had the impression that theory was well ahead of uh, observations. So I decided to join an, an inter international collaboration at the Dark Energy Survey at that time. And uh, yeah, so I'm becoming an observational cosmologist, but I don't consider myself an observational cosmologist. In fact, uh, Raul was mentioning the uh, superconducting super collider, and I have to say that uh, I was a fellow of the superconducting super collider, and my fellowship disappeared when the superconducting super collider was canceled in 1993. That's not the reason I moved to cosmology. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to focus on um, large scale surveys. And uh, uh, so Bia said that uh, you know, the, the model is not high energy physics, but I would uh, say that in large scale surveys, you know, so there are large groups of people working. So the model is really uh, going um, inspired by collaborations in high energy physics. So the idea is that an instrument is built, a telescope, camera, spectrographer, et cetera, and it's used by a collaboration, large number of people, to collect a large amount of data that is then used to do science. And uh, there were already some discussions on particip how to participate, and uh, people can participate, groups can participate by making contributions either in cash or in kind and, and join these uh, uh, collaborations. So um, I'm part of this, uh, we're talking about organizations, no? you, have to, you have large groups of people, so you have to organize these people. And I'm part of this uh, uh, Laboratorio Interinstitucional de e Astronomia, so we, which has headquarters at the Observatorio Nacional, National Observatory in Rio de Janeiro. And also I'm part, I'm actually the vice coordinator of this National Institute of Science and Technology. That's a project uh, that's given by the uh, um, Brazilian uh, government. And we give, this, this organization here uh, gives support to different projects, so Dark Energy Survey, the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument, Large Synaptic Survey Telescope, Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and, and the trans Neptunian Objects. So for cosmology, it's mostly these four things. Provide scientists, programmers, database administrators, workflow specialists, high performance computing, storage engineer network, etc. So this is something that has to do with science and and, and data and, and the organization. Um, there is a framework to organize these things. So this is to give an idea of different um, some of the different surveys. So someone said that the uh, surveys can be um, basically classified into imaging and spectroscopy. And this is a roadmap of some things that we can do maybe until 2032. So we started in 2006 participating. EBOS is part of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey to look for barium acoustic oscillations. And we started participating in 2008. We started participating in 2006 in the Dark Energy Survey. Uh, so we have a group called the Dark Energy Survey Brazil. And uh, 2016, we have, a, we have a, uh, also a group participating in DASI and also a group participating in this LSST thing. So you can see that we have a, a, a roadmap until 2032 of, uh, uh, for this uh, um, large-scale survey. Now, answering a question that Nathan uh, asked, how, how collaboration forms? So this is an example, okay? This is an example of this collaborations I mentioned. This is just an example of dark energy survey, which I, I know more about um, because I was involved, I'm involved with it. So it takes time. And this is the timeline for a collaboration. So it started with announcement of opportunity in 2003. And in, in the announcement of opportunity, the whole community could apply, right? So people from Fermilab applied, and they put up a consortium, and they uh, got, the, uh, um, they got this, uh, this opportunity to build an instrument. So they decided to build this, what is called a dark energy camera. So there was four years of research and development to, to this camera, then three more, uh, three more years to build the camera, 
And the first light of this camera on this, uh, there was this, the telescope was old, was called the, it's called the Blanco Telescope in Chile. The first light was to, uh, to, uh, September 2012. And, and, the, the, um, and the observations just finished uh, January of this year. So you see how long it takes, right? So this was, what, 16 years more or less that takes to a project to, from the start, from the call of opportunity to finish. So this project's finished, okay? They do finish. <laughs> so now we are still analyzing the data, but the project is, is finished. So it takes time, it takes people, because there are lots of things to be done, and Darkness Survey uh, has around 300 scientists from different countries in the world. These are the directors. Rich Crown is the current director. It takes organization. This is the chart for the uh, Dark Energy Survey organization. So, of course, I don't want you to steal the names, but there's science, there's management, there's executive committees, there's data committees, etc. It's complicated. And uh, in Brazil, we participate in this with an organization uh, which is uh, in the framework of LINEA. And it takes resources. So, uh, for DES, for instance, it was $300,000 uh, uh, in cash contribution, but mostly is in kind contribution. So, developers of uh, some uh, um, some software, science port on quick reduce. There's an IT team of 10, 10 people, more or less. And something that's really important is computing power for data analysis. So this is something that, you know, it's not only data, it's not only computing power to get from the data to uh, uh, raw data to some cat science catalog that you can actually do science with, but also in order to extract, you know, science results from, to, from Cosmo, to, uh, results of cosmology, we need computing power to run chains, et cetera. So this, this agreement has allowed for 10 PIs, and the, in the case of Dark Energy Survey, an unlimited number of postdocs and students. And something that's really important also is participation collaboration meetings. And last December, the, collab the international collaboration meeting was hosted at uh, Unicum. So this is just an example of, uh, of an international collaboration. And this is my last slide, just to re remind people what is our main goal. So our main goal, is to start from images like this, so it's an imaging survey, and it's a long road to get to the cosmology. So this is uh, some of the uh, main results of the year one analysis of Dark Energy Survey. I don't want to go into details, of course. I just want to emphasize this long road here, you know, from data to uh, cosmology. So this is a major challenge that uh, we all have to face. I think that's, that's all I want to say. At the beginning of this meeting, Nathan, okay, no, don't worry. Uh, Nathan complained a bit about uh, uh, we have uh, three schools uh, at the same time. This is a way of seeing the, the, this problem. But uh, the other way is to assume that we are in a thriving moment of our science in São Paulo, and uh, thanks to FAPESP, because uh, we see uh, the situation in Brazil. Uh, a bit gloomy right now, and but despite everything, the science in São Paulo is in a very good position. And uh, of course, everybody who works here know that FAPESP is responsible for that. I'd like to start talking about SPANET that Brito just mentioned uh, a few minutes ago. SPANET São Paulo Astronomy Network is a kind of alliance between institutions uh, doing astronomy in this state. Uh, we don't have funds. We work with the funds of the projects. And we try uh, mostly to promote networking among the scientists within the state. The objectives are to optimize the use of the available resources and uh, increase the visibility of the science done here in the state. Uh, by doing network uh, is important for um, senior scientists and mostly for young scientists. Uh, uh, allow share information, new opportunities, and allow for new collaborations among people involved. We have uh, done that mainly through the organization of uh, very informal workshops. We have done uh, our red workshops on radio astronomy, galaxy clusters, time series. We have uh, organized at the beginning of the year a school on deep learning astronomy. 
and we are publishing an international newsletter four times a year. Uh, the next workshop will be in October on uh, instrumentation in astronomy. We plan to, to put together everybody uh, developing uh, instrumentation in astronomy in the state to discuss the challenges and problems the, that we uh, face and uh, look for common solutions. I participate in several collaborations, but I will just mention one here. That is the PFS prime focus uh, spectrograph uh, that should be put in the Subaru uh, telescope in the next year. In the, the next year. Uh, PFS is a, a bet by the Subaru Observatory. Uh, to face the challenge of the big telescopes that uh, you uh, have uh, their first light by uh, during the next decade. As you know, GMT and the probably uh, ELT will have their first light during the next decade. TMT, I don't know what will happen. But um, in order to become competitive, uh, has an eight meter uh, telescope with telescopes of much larger size, uh, uh, so the Subaru Observatory decided to, to build uh, a very challenging instrument, uh, a spectrograph with uh, almost 2,400 fibers and uh, covering a very large field of view, 1.3 degrees. Those uh, of you who know uh, the big telescopes nowadays, like Gemini, VLT, etc., all these telescopes in general have a very small uh, field of view. This is not the case of Subaru. It has the largest field of view amongst the uh, largest telescopes available right now. Uh, it's interesting to, to mention that why we are participating in this project. The reason is that Brazil is a member of the Gemini Observatory. In 2000, more or less, uh, we had a meeting in Aspen, I remember I was there with Beatriz, where uh, Gemini was discussing uh, their, uh, its next instrumentation. And uh, in that occasion, what uh, was named WIFMOS appeared as a uh, a very important instrument for the next gen, uh, instrumentation generation of Gemini. Due to technical problems, in particular the Gemini optics needed to be changed in order to support uh, multi-fiber spectrography with, uh, with a large field of view, <coughs> and uh, Gemini decided to do it with Subaru, but uh, after, not long after, they decided to give up of this project due to the lack of funds. The Subaru Observatory on the other side uh, received support from the Japanese government that recognized that this instrument would be very important for the observatory and decided to fund the instrument independently in a new collaboration that uh, is led by Itoshi Murayama from the Institute of Physics and Mathematics of the University of the Tokyo University and uh, also Professor uh, uh, in, in the University of California. The participation, our participation in this uh, instrument is in kind. Brazil is responsible for the development of the fiber system of this instrument. This is a very challenging part of the project because the fiber system is the only subsystem of the project that interfaces with all other subsystems with the prime focus instrument uh, and uh, in the other extreme with the spectrographs. <coughs> I, I would say that the organizational aspect of this collaboration is very simple compared with others, in particular with this that you just mentioned, because right now most of the effort is put in the building of the instrument and <coughs> we have a steering committee uh, with members of the participating institutions. We have now 14 uh, uh, participations. 
Uh, and below this stream committee, we have mostly uh, technical groups developing parts, uh, building actually parts of the instrument, as well as the science groups that uh, this is curious because uh, despite the fact that this instrument will be put in the uh, Subaru uh, telescope, we need to convince by a proper science case the Japanese community that it's worth to spend this $80 million, that is the cost of this instrument, uh, in doing it and putting it uh, at the Subaru telescope. So most of the uh, scientific effort now is in writing uh, science cases in galaxy archaeology, um, galaxy evolution, and cosmology that uh, will be competitive during the next decade uh, when this instrument will be in full operation. I think that uh, I will stop here. Thank you. <laughs> So I was actually told that we should at most put one or two slides. And given that I was um, born in Germany, I actually did that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I was thinking about um, what would be useful for me to talk about uh, here, here in this audience, also mostly for students. And I thought it's um, partly how did I get involved in large collaborations, what, what happened at the various points uh, in my, my academic career. So I got my PhD in Germany at the University of Bonn, um, and I was not involved in any large collaborations whatsoever. So I was uh, a theorist. I had a theory project. I was working mostly just by myself and my computer. And lots of other PhD students at the University of Bonn were actually involved in larger collaborations, namely at that point in time, the so-called CFHTLS survey, the Canada-France-Hawaii Telescope Legacy Survey. Um, and I got my PhD in weak gravitational lensing, so lots of people were involved in image reduction, getting the redshifts of galaxies, trying to measure weak lensing signal, and then trying to infer cosmological parameters. Knight tried to do all of that with um, simulated data. Um, actually, I was, I was even rejected from getting into the collaboration because they said, you're, this, that's way too theoretical what you're doing. This, uh, we don't really have, have use for this. Those bases are all covered. Um, and then I took their public data and actually applied one of these small theoretical projects, one of the well, cheap theory ideas, as I would call it, um, to those public data sets and show that there is still um, contamination in the data sets that have been previously uh, uh, undetected. And, um, well, of course, they then said, yeah, uh, we were completely aware of this. Um, and, uh, but it is a nice idea, it is a nice method, we would like to integrate that and, and, and you're welcome to join. Um, but that was already at the end of my PhD and I actually moved on to my next position. So um, it was not a very successful start with, with large collaborations. Um, I moved to uh, the, the Ohio State University. Uh, this is the football stadium which uh, encompasses, uh, which, which can hold 105,000 people, so um, that was quite quite impressive to me, um, uh, as a CCAP fellow. And that's where I got involved in the Dark Energy Survey. So the Dark Energy Survey, um, Brazil is a, is a member of, of DES, many people here in this room work on DES, um, has just completed survey operations. It has observed one-eighth of the, of the overall sky, 5,000 square degrees, um, camera field of view is actually 3.1-something uh, square degrees. Um, so it's a very large camera. It can map the sky very rapidly, and it's a fantastic data set to do cosmology with. Um, I did not quite know that in 2009 when I joined this, but I knew that the data was, uh, was very likely uh, coming in and would be good. And that is one advice that I would give to, um, to students only work on data sets that already exist or that are really, really close to uh, being in existence. Um, because when I, when I was still doing my PhD in, in, in the theory world, I had lots of uh, uh, co-PhD students who were proposing, well, I'm going to do cosmology with a kids survey. That was one proposal. Kids got delayed by seven years. 
the PhD project completely fell through. It had to be done on some other data set. So it is really important to work on data that exists already, or you have to have a plan to just do a theory project. That's, I think, very important. Um, I got deeper involved in DES when I moved to my second position at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I started to lead a smaller group that was uh, tasked to measure two-point correlation functions, and I also got involved into, in the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which is going to be the next larger step, like DES is going to map more than half of the sky and to an even deeper, uh, uh, to, to, to deeper uh, depth and in more bands and at higher image quality, et cetera, et cetera. So LSST is going to be quite a fantastic data set to work with, and there's many science collaborations. I'm mostly involved in the dark energy science collaboration, but there's also science collaborations on transients, galaxy formations, whatnot. Um, so this is something that is quite interesting to look into um, and, and perhaps to, to get involved. Um, then, after two more years in Philly, I moved to Pasadena on the west coast of the US and uh, uh, took a position as a staff scientist at NASA JPL, which was a very different environment because you're now in one of the largest collaborations there is, which is NASA. Um, and that comes with pros and cons. So being in such a large collaboration also means there is a large of bureaucracy, there is a large of bureaucratic overhead. And that is another problem of very large collaborations. And you should look at those collaborations carefully if you're a student. And you should ask your advisors, is this a collaboration that has a lot of bureaucratic overhead? Or is this an efficient collaboration where I can do some good science and also be known for my contributions and for my good science? So those are important um, criteria for, for choosing which collaboration to work on. Um, at NASA, um, I worked on a space mission which is called WFIRST Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope um, and also a smaller mission. So this is a, what NASA calls a flagship mission. Flagship missions are very expensive. This one is supposed to cost $3.2 billion. The current flagship mission that's in the news for cost overrun is JWST which is very expensive um, now. Um, WFIRST is still on track in terms of its budget. Um, and also a, a smaller mission which is called SPHEREX. Um, that is an acronym, but I'm spectrometer of something. Um, it has many different science cases, but it's going to be an all-sky survey in very many different bands. It is not going to be very deep, but it is an all-sky survey and should provide a very interesting data set to look at. So those two missions, um, WFIRST and SPHEREX, SPHEREX was recently funded. It is a NASA MIDEX uh, mission that's up to some uh, $250 uh, million, um, uh, supposed to launch in 2023, supposed to launch in 2025. Um, don't necessarily take those dates for granted. Um, they do tend to shift backwards the closer the launch date actually uh, becomes. Um, yeah, and then um, I got a very nice offer from the University of Arizona and moved from my cushy NASA place uh, to the University of Arizona um, to start there as, a, as an assistant professor. And um, uh, the University of Arizona is also involved in DESI. It is an institutional member of DESI. Um, DESI is a spectroscopic survey, mostly in the northern hemisphere, but there will be some overlap with LSST. I have not done anything for DESI, and that's like the last important advice. If you were too deeply involved in, in too many collaborations, you will not be efficient. So I mostly right now work on DES, LSST. I do some work for W first. I barely work on SPHEREX, and I do not yet work on DESI. Um, but depending on if one of these data sets gets more and more interesting, and it is very interesting to look into combinations of these data sets, then, um, then this might shift. So within these surveys, I lead, so here I lead the theory combined probes working group. Here I lead the weak lensing working group. Here I lead some um, mission forecasting deliverable to look into what is the science return as a function of if you change the survey strategy. Do you want to go deep? Do you want to go wide? Do you want to just use one band? Do you want to use many bands? Those are all decisions that are interesting to explore. And a lot of this involves coding to forecast these um, uh, these science endeavors. And that's actually what I do most of the time. When I'm fed up with uh, some of the committee work or the administrative work, I just go and code. That's very nice and very relaxing. All right, thank you.
So I'm uh, Renan Barkana from Tel Aviv University in Israel. So I'll, uh, I guess I'll hit many of the themes that have been discussed, but in a different example. So I'm a theoretical cosmologist. Uh, still, my, most of my papers are just myself with a student or two. And I'm very happy that it's still possible to do that kind of research. Um, but uh, the most exciting thing for a theorist, I mean, uh, at some point, so in, uh, the field is, uh, that I work on now is a 21 centimeter cosmology, just trying to discover basically the first stars through uh, radio wave signature. So uh, for a long time, theory was uh, much more advanced than the observations, but once the observations start catching up, the most exciting thing for a theorist is to interact with the newest data. So you have to do uh, to find a way to to get access to data. So uh, interestingly, in the, in this field, there are two very different approaches. One of them is uh, just a, a relatively uh, well, uh, not necessarily simple, but at least small uh, teles radio telescope that just tries to measure the average uh, intensity on the sky as a function of wavelength or redshift. So that's uh, small science, just uh, you know, small collaborations of a few people, and uh, and then you have the trying to map the sky and find and measure the fluctuations, and those are very large projects. And I'm involved in the Square Kilometer Array (SKA), which is going to be the largest uh, radio telescope uh, basically ever built. Uh, it's like uh, a 600. Uh, a uh, million euro budget for the first phase, which is only one that is definitely going forward. So, um, and so, and the, uh, so there's been like a, like a competition uh, between these uh, large products. So, for example, things like LOFAR and other things that are happening now. Uh, there are inter big interferometers. And, uh, and the small, uh, almost tabletop experiment uh, trying to measure the global signal. Uh, but uh, as, far, as long as nothing has been detected, it was basically a competition. And uh, last year, there was a first claim detection by one of the smaller, uh, uh, an experiment called EDGES. And uh, it found uh, something surprising. And I, I um, suggested that maybe they discovered some uh, new property of dark matter, so there was a lot of excitement. But at the moment, uh, we're still waiting for uh, independent confirmation. And I mean, eventually, we'll, we'll see how the, the big experiments come in. Uh, I mean, hopefully, we'll know before the SK, but, if, but maybe the SK will come in and clean up everything eventually. And uh, so, I mean, if, if what the, the small experiment detected uh, will be confirmed eventually by everybody, then the, they will get most of the glory, I think, for being first. So we'll, we'll see how this works out. Um, in any case, I mean, the large experience will have a lot more information, certainly, but uh, still, there's a lot of uh, glory in being in being first. Uh, so, so there's still uh, room for small science as well. But uh, but one interesting aspect here is that so in the SKA is actually uh, the many interesting aspects of the organization. So one thing is that um, so that it at some point it. Uh, it was decided, and I think this was, you know, there's a lot of politi politics in this, uh, basically the, uh, the collaboration. Uh, there are many people uh, in the UK that were involved uh, early on and a number of different countries. Uh, uh, so there's some in Europe, but, but many other countries. So they didn't want, for example, the, the European uh, science, big uh, political organizations to take over. So, uh, so what happened is it became basically uh, the, by, uh, the participation goes by country, so not by institution or by individuals. It's all by, by participating countries uh, through the government. So there's now a political agreement that's, uh, that has been signed and needs to be ratified by the various countries. Um, so, uh, so there are some limitations. Uh, for example, I'm from Israel where unfortunately we have basically no uh, radio observers, so we have many uh, a lot of observational astronomy, but it's all optical, infrared, and so on, and not uh, we haven't developed radio astronomy. Uh, but uh, so uh, there's some restrictions, for example, in terms of uh, leadership, you know, formal leadership in the organization. You have to be from a, a participating country. The you know the this is, these are huge budgets, uh, so the countries there demand to get their money back. 
Uh, but still, uh, but it's uh, it's open to everybody for in terms of participating in, uh, significantly in the science. So for 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 my portion, for the the part which has to do with 21 centimeter cosmology from the signal from from high redshift, um, it it has to be basically one big collaboration. So it's not like uh, you have a, a telescope where you can uh, you know when people can propose to use it in very with various ideas. But the the issue is that um, in in this subject, uh, our own galaxy and other radio galaxies produce a huge foreground, which is much, much brighter than the cosmological signal. So before you can even think about doing anything with the, the high reach of signal from first stars, you have to clean out all the foreground very, very, very precisely. So you need to calibrate basically perfectly because, again, the foreground, unlike the CMB, uh, for example, there's no, uh, there's no frequency where the cosmological signal is brighter than the foreground. The, the foregrounds are always much, much brighter. So it all starts by uh, cleaning out the foregrounds very accurately. So for example, LOFAR uh, has uh, like 30,000 radio sources, uh, point sources in the sky that they are actively subtracting bef from the map. And I guess SKA will have even more. So, uh, so you, because of this, this first step is, is huge and it's really the, you know, the, the biggest problem. And this has to be done before you get to the science. Uh, it only makes sense for everybody to work together um, so that the people who clean the map get get credit for everything else that wasn't possible until uh, this first foreground cleaning. Uh, but uh, I mean, as a result, uh, it was a little bit sort of uh, funny that you know, in the first few meetings of uh, the science working group, uh, there were many, many theorists and very few people who know anything about how to clean the data, but the theory won't get anywhere without uh, practical people we know how to you know, you know model dust uh, and uh, and all kinds of things and you know and do calibration so uh, and the other aspect is that so, so I, I I try to participate in, in the meetings and and do some some work for uh, SKA but as much as as possible I try I mean it's pretty na naturally most of them my work is aligned with the, the SKA you know 21 centimeter goals in in any case so I don't want a uh, specific SKA work to take up too much of my my time, just because it, uh, the timeline is, is a bit unclear, so or or a little bit long term. So now they're saying the the it's it it is actually going forward. A lot of the funding is I think uh, is going for, is there. I mean it's not maybe completely uh, finalized. There's still I mean uh, like a month ago New Zealand decided to. Uh, to go to go out of the of the project, although just you know it's a tiny contribution anyway, relatively. But um, uh, there's uh, the plan is for 2025 to start uh, really getting uh, preliminary data, but then who knows how long it will take to you know to learn to study the instrument and to calibrate it. In this whole field of the, uh, dealing with the foreground, you have to be very careful. I mean, there have been some some published claims that were then retracted for upper limits uh, that turn out to be incorrect. So, so there's a learning curve in this kind of new field and, and who knows when uh, we'll get real, uh, the first real reliable result from the SK. Uh, so you, you don't want to really plan your whole uh, career based on, based on that. You, it's nice to participate and eventually, hopefully, very good things will come. And the other thing is uh, bureaucracy. So, you know, things have gotten delayed. There's been a uh, cost cutting, uh, you know, one, at least one major, they called it rebaselining, basically cost cutting because things were getting out of. And, and you know, the whole thing is, is mo a big part of the cost of these, um, of these projects in radio astronomy, uh, you know, is, uh, is basically computational because you, you have lots of antennas. Uh, out in the field, and it's the computer that puts them all together to one telescope. So you're basically projecting to what will be the, you know, a supercomputer that you can afford in 2025, and hopefully, you know, Moore's law in some some form continues to go. And and that, so there's quite a bit of uncertainty, I'm sure, about that still. Um, because of that, you have to be a little bit cautious with the with the timeline. Uh, but but uh, there's some you know there's some bureaucracy there. So in the SKA, we are only one group, so, and I think we have more than uh, 100 uh, participants. 
and uh, but there's something like 14 or or something uh, different working groups because it's all of astronomy all of astronomy basically has some uh, radio astronomy aspect so there are many so there are different demand from different people and there's a huge administration on the top that is trying to somehow make the correct decision to account for everybody's needs uh, so as a result the the, antenna, the basic antenna design has uh, changed uh, really beyond the, the final day that it was supposed to be fixed. So, uh, but I guess in, a, in any project, uh, in any huge project like this, there are in inevitable complications and delays. But uh, there are certainly very serious people involved, so hopefully it will uh, work in the end. And uh, uh, so, uh, so I think uh, hopefully you know, more generally, we can have this balance of uh, small signs still being possible because it's the nicest thing. It's a, the place where creativity is uh, is most uh, you know apparent, easiest to to manifest, and also large collaborations because uh, you can't compete with you know with new instruments that are much more sensitive than anyone else. Uh, so that's inevitable. Okay. Questions? I can start with one question. So are any of these collaborations exclusive in the sense that there's some, obviously they're doing similar things. Can, I, I mean, are you allowed to be in as many collaborations as you want or can you share results between collaborations, for example? There's a microphone here. Um, uh, so, so there's there's a couple of difficulties, right? So first of all, um, you need to have funding for these for these large projects, and sometimes these projects are funded by what's called PI slots. Um, so, um, for example, let's take LSST Desk, which is uh, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope Dark Energy Science Collaboration. So LSST, um, I think, shares data rights all across the U.S. But now there's been recently some very murky re reorganization of how data rights will be distributed to the international community. And that's all a little bit up in the air as of two-ish two months, I believe. The Dark Energy Science Collaboration, I think you can join very, very easily, but that does not give you any kind of data rights. That does give you access, though, to the desk-specific tools. So if you're a theorist, if you want to act, uh, interact with uh, other theorists, if you're interested in the desk simulations and want to use the desk simulations, you can just join that collaboration, just cost you an email. Um, but if you want to analyze the data, uh, I think that's, that's more involved. Um, DES, uh, you have to be at a DES institution or you have to work for somebody who has DES data rights. Uh, but there is also public data out there, which is very good, which is very nicely documented, and which is very nice to just um, analyze if you have a new method. So I would strongly recommend to people just start a small project on the public data that's out there. There's also data from the kids survey. There's data from the HSC survey out there. Um, which is nicely documented, and if you have a new idea or a new methodology, just apply it and go for it. So the, sh the short answer is no, not everything is freely accessible. Sorry. I could say the same for PFS. Uh, PFS should start the Subaru strategic plan, say, next year, and the survey will take uh, uh, almost five years to be completed. And during this period, we should have uh, uh, two or three data releases when the data then are public for everybody. And also, this happens with other surveys. For example, uh, in the case of S+, Plus, the Southern Photometric S Plus is a photometric survey with a small telescope that is being conducted from Cerro Tololo, what Eric mentioned briefly uh, at some point. And uh, we had uh, a couple of weeks ago the first data release of the survey that is now available for who wants to work with this data. So, 
how can the rest of South America follow Sao Paulo's example? And how, how could we potentially build meaningful collaborations in South America? It's mostly aimed at the first presentation. Because I think it's really incredible what's happening in Sao Paulo. But yeah, I'm wondering how could it permeate to the rest of the territory? Yeah. Uh, the, there are some initiatives to, to establish certain collaborations among research or starting with researchers in Latin America. Uh, but, you know, one of the things that tends to hinder that is the fact that most countries are not willing to commit funding for complex and large things in science that might take 10 years to get to a result. So this is a, a complication. But, for example, when, when Brazil decided to, to build this synchrotron light source, uh, the researchers who were who created the idea, tried very hard to obtain uh, interest from other countries in Latin America, which they did. There was interest, but no government was willing to commit to the cost. So Brazil decided to go at it alone. And they did the first synchrotron light source, and now they are finishing, we are finishing the second one. So uh, it is challenging. There, there is one collaboration which more or less goes in this direction that you mentioned, which is the project Bingo, which I mentioned briefly. Uh, because a relevant part of the leadership of the collaboration is in, is in Brazil and it's from Brazil, even though they are working with the colleagues in Manchester and Jodro Bank and other places. Hi, Daniel Faes from IAG USP. Uh, I would like to know your opinion about uh, the connections with, from the universities and FAPESP with the industry, because I think participating in instrumentation of these projects involves uh, high technology, and this means investment and probably having some common goals between academia and uh, industry. And also, we for uh, what I'm mostly involved is uh, optical instrumentation for astronomy. And instrumentation could be a, a bargain chip for uh, participation in, in such projects. So if we could create a common institution for that, I think that uh, would be have very helpful when negotiating to join in new, new projects. Just, just, just an example of a common goal, right? And also, uh, so in, in, in this point, I see uh, a good example that Laerte brought that uh, probably, well, not probably, but uh, uh, LNA, uh, we are doing the fiber optics for Subaru because we had a, a previous good experience or a training in some sense at solar telescope. So um, it's, this is a good example to say how it's, how it's hard to do high-tech technology with, without a planning or a background. And yeah, that's it. So I'm uh, just sharing some thoughts, and I would like to, to hear it from you. Well, uh, as you mentioned, uh, our involvement with uh, optical fibers is due to the experience of uh, LNA, Laboratório Nacional de Astrofísica, that is outside São Paulo. Despite this fact, FAPESP is responsible for most of the equipment that is there. Uh, I hope that Brito is not hearing me. And, uh, uh, and actually, we were able to start in LNA a very good expertise uh, in this uh, sector of engineering. Uh, 
uh, developing instrumentation for the solar telescope, as you mentioned, and also building detectors and the small uh, cameras for uh, uh, observatories abroad. Uh, this uh, led to, a, I would say, to a constitution of a group of very good expertise on optical fibers in Brazil. And uh, that was the motive why we were accepted in the PFS collaboration, because people knew uh, before the expertise that we had. And we were also able to keep this expertise not only in the academy, but also in the industry. So now we have uh, groups of engineers and the local industries in the state of Sao Paulo, mostly in Sao Carlos, uh, that uh, develop projects for us. For example, in the case of PFS, uh, besides the fibers, there are lots of components in this equipment. There are uh, uh, connectors uh, of several kinds. There are mechanisms to, to avoid the focal ratio degradation, things like that. Uh, that we have now a team uh, among several uh, small enterprises here in the state that are able to develop projects for this sort of thing that we, is very specific but very competitive, I would say, uh, even at the international level. And uh, this expertise that has been built uh, along the years f uh, for many people uh, will continue, I'm sure, because, uh, for example, I know that Beatrice is preparing uh, a project that will continue to use the expertise of this group and the expertise of the companies that we have assembled uh, around the project of building instruments uh, based on optical fibers. A quick question. So who is doing this coordination with industry? Is the PI of the project or, or the Well, uh, uh, I rely very much on the technical expertise of people at the LNA and also at the companies themselves. Uh, because, uh, you know, by now I know people, we know each other from a long time, so we are able to uh, discuss directly with them. I'm Alessandro Daroglite from uh, IHE USPI. Um, I have two questions, in fact, completely unrelated to each other. Uh, so let me start with the, perhaps the difficult one. Um, I think Laerte made a beautiful case of showing the time scale of an instrument of medium high complexity, which from conception to first light, it takes about 10 years. Um, when you want to design such an instrument, you mostly want to have your technical team on board from design at least to first light. So, um, and I, I wonder if um, most of you guys in various collaborations have the, have the same feeling, but most importantly is um, how do you manage to keep, for example, a mechanical engineer or an optical engineer um, inside a project for 10 years, because you try to have a, um, optical engineers as students or postdocs on soft money, they get contracts of two or three years, they build, it. maybe you get one person who designs part of your instrument, and at some point, the person who gets the instrument on Sky is someone who has, doesn't have the same feeling as the person who designed the instrument. So it can lead to disaster. Most, as far as I understand, most of the um, big observatories, they actually do have their own staff astronomers, uh, sorry, staff optical engineers, staff mechanics. Um, so long story short, um, is there a way to help this thing within the state of Sao Paulo, for example? In other yeah. words, help build the instruments inside the, in the state of Sao Paulo. I think we are lucky to have FAPESP here. Otherwise, uh, this would be impossible, I would say. Because, for example, in the case of PFS, our participation in the project is worth $5 million. 
uh, and is already completely funded. Of course, FAPESP didn't put $5 million because they are at the time of people, engineers, things like that, that are also included in this budget. But uh, I would say that the fundraising and the keep the momentum of the, the money flux uh, are big challenges. Fortunately, I think that up to now, we, I, I personally should thank FAPES for recognizing that this is an issue and for keeping their support to us all the time. That's uh, what I would say. Uh, I'm confident that this is something that will be a legacy for the new generation of astronomers. So I'm very confident that this investment uh, will have a big return in the scientific terms, in terms of formation of our scientific community here, things like that. I, I would add here that the way we see that from FAPESP is that the universities that host the project must come up with some support of exactly the type that you are saying. If a university wants to have a PI who has a $40 million grant to do some complicated thing that's going to last five, seven, ten years, this university must be willing to hire one or two or three engineers. If they are not, we simply don't award the money because it's, it would be a waste of money. And every university in the state of Sao Paulo or the main research universities, if they want, they can. When they say they cannot, it's because they do not want. It's not because they cannot. Because, I mean, a university like the University of, you work at the University of Sao Paulo. How many people work there? 10,000. I'm an astronomer. I count one, two, many. <laughs> <laughs> okay, many. <laughs> many times 10 to the whatever. So they have a lot of people. So they could have two or three who are engineers to support the research which is being funded from elsewhere. That's what we look for. Um, I abuse of your patience. Uh, this question is a little bit more general uh, and actually goes very much for all the for all the projects. And it's a little bit inspired by a, com a comment that Alessandra made before. Um, how do the collaborations deal with uh, diversity, gender balance uh, across the various levels of the collaboration? So you're, you're asking an all-male panel about that. Just, just pointing that out. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess there's, there's no way to hide that. Um, um, this could be done much better. Um, this has um, started recently, I think, to become a more important topic in all collaborations, as far as I can see. Um, but it is not handled extremely well. So, I mean, in terms of formalities, um, there is a diversity and inclusion a policy in DES and LSST desk. Um, there is very clear policies about, um, well, how to behave during collaboration meetings, et cetera, et cetera. There is ombuds people who you can talk to. There is confidential um, uh, people in the collaboration uh, where you can bring, bring issues to. Um, but in terms of like gender balance um, across leadership, there is no rules like that, right? There is not a quota or anything. Um, it is in people's minds, and I think um, it's gotten a bit better. But there is still, I don't know. So, so there's places where I see this, which is, you know, if in telecons, for example, right? If somebody with a very deep voice very confidently says something, that is usually not that harshly questioned. Whereas some, uh, if there is a junior female person saying something, that is sometimes questioned at an um, unjustified, scrutinized level, which is, um, and I think that's, that's something where uh, senior people have to just be aware 
that, um, that 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 there is some behavior that is just implemented in these uh, imprinted in these large collaborations that you need to actively uh, uh, try to to even out. That's not that's not very easy. It's not quick. Um, I also know that in uh, uh, in in Euclid, I mean, you, you perhaps want to say something about that. There is now the attempt to um, uh, to to increase gender diversity. But I also heard the story. I'm, Coming from Europe, most of my science friends are still in Euclid, it's like the publication board, which is yeah. uh, led by my former supervisor. It's all male, <laughs> um, Peter Schneider. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so that, and, and that caused some, uh, uh, well, I mean, it was noted, let me put it that way. So I think we have a long way to go, and I think um, it is important for everybody to note that even in very small settings, like in, in telecons, right, it is important to kind of be um, well, to, to be very careful how you what you what you criticize, right? You should never criticize a person, etc. You should criticize the topic, and so on. Um, there's a long way to go still. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, diversity is a very complicated issue. Um, so uh, it's very tricky how to address it. So I don't want to get into that. But yeah, my comment was that Euclid is trying to make an effort, and I, I see that they are successful in certain things. He's referring to a funny, <laughs> let's call it funny event at the U last Euclid consortium meeting, when Peter Schneider was talking as uh, he's the head of the board of, uh, not board of examiner, editorial board, and he was showing in one slide all the relevant people in that board, and it was a slide of senior male scientists. So somebody from the audience, unfortunately a young woman, so that didn't help, asked, raised her hand and said, uh, uh, I don't see much diversity in that board. And there was total silence, 400 people silent, and Peter Snyder <laughs> replied, got upset and he said, I was given the task to form this board, I chose the best people for this job. End of the story. And <laughs> so it was perhaps not the best reply, but the most striking thing is that nobody of the 400 people in there said anything at the time. Then they, I mean, there was a reaction. So now there, there is an open call for new positions in the editorial board, and they stress the fact that they will be very careful uh, with diversity when giving this new position. So eventually something happened, but yeah. yeah. I just want to quickly add, so I'm not part of the Euclid collaboration, but that story has reached me. <laughs> um, uh, in, in DES, uh, one of the uh, science co-chairs, so basically the highest scientific position that we have is, is a woman. Uh, in DESK, in LSST DESK, the spokesperson, uh, Rachel Mandelbaum, is, uh, is a woman. I think DESK is generally doing uh, quite a good job at this, and generally it is a, a very democratic institution. So in terms of the, the spokesperson is elected, right, by the members. So you become a member of DESK, you elect the, the leadership. There is a collaboration council which makes the most important decisions, it's also elected. Um, and I think these people have recognized that in order to cover like the broad basis and in order to fully exploit uh, all the potential that you have in a collaboration, you have to uh, build a diverse leadership. I think that's been noted at least in, in, in those collaborations, yeah. Coming back to his question, I mean, I would like to point out that all of the, the, the surveys that uh, Tim described, all of them are actually based or led by national labs. SLEC, Fermilab, LBL, involvement of NCSA, NASA. So it's very hard for universities to do that, basically, I mean. And in Europe, it's based on governments. So. I have a question for uh, Representative Fapaspo. Can, can the, the other states also have funding agencies? is not as well developed as FAPAS, uh, but can um, the, these FAPs make regional agreements? For example, you need a Rio de Janeiro, Sao Paulo supercomputer 
so we can archive all these collaborations and make the analysis. You know, something that you know it can it can do between the federal government that funds really big projects and things that are just for you know uh, one state. Uh, so that's my question and my comment for the diversity part, because I think that's something that I can comment. Yeah, is that at least in the collaborations that I've been working, that with DS, LSSD, it was really nice. I had a, never a problem. But one thing that I, I see is that in order for this diversity to reach up, uh, uh, the, the, the hiring at the universities need to be more diverse. If, if we still have only 10% of women in the physics departments, uh, we, one, we oversubscribe this 10%, and two, uh, we will not reach balance in the, uh, you know, in the decision board. So it's something that has to be across, you know, not only collaborations, but also universities. So are there any questions between the... Can I, can I comment? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you, you asked about collaboration with funding agencies of other states in Brazil. We do that many times. Uh, the challenge there is that most of the time, the funding agencies in the other states have difficulties to commit to large commitments and long times. But whenever that was possible, we did this kind of collaboration, but never for a large thing like a supercomputer and stuff like that. But we have done that with the national government to buy a supercomputer that is offered for use to anyone in Brazil. Any questions? Well, does anybody in the round table want to ask a question or make a comment? Last chance? OK, so let's thank the panelists again for the discussion. So there's, there's food upstairs for people that want to stay and talk and 